welcome and thank everyone for being here and allowing me this opportunity to discuss something that I'm very passionate about, and that topic is weight loss. And so today there's a couple objectives. I think number one is to dispel some of the pervasive myths that are occurring in the weight loss field and then hopefully give you some tools. I hope that we'll learn something today. I hope that we'll have fun and I will try to leave some questions as there is a lot of topics that I'm gonna go through pretty superficially, but we can go through in more time and more detail if needed. And with that, I have no financial conflicts of interest. I am not part of the kale industry. However, I am a tree hugging hippie and that sort of disclosure should be known as there are probably some biases that I do have that if you guys do notice them, please call me out. Um, that, is, that is kind of a, a bias that I am aware of right now. And so the first thing, and can you guys hear me okay in the back? Why is weight loss important, right? Well, there is the general vanity purpose of weight loss and our society, social media tells us we ought to look a certain way. So this was supposed to occur on January 6th, right during the new year. The number one New Year's resolution year after year after year is to lose weight. Just recently did a survey on physicians, more important than their finances, more important than spending more time with their kids and their family. Physicians themselves wanted to lose more weight. So that was their number one resolution also. Why else is it important? Well, there's a tremendous cost, a tremendous burden. CHF annually costs America about $31 billion. Obesity in and of itself, more than a quarter trillion dollars. That's, that's staggering. And then not only is it a cost from the national level, there's an individual level. Healthcare for individuals that are obese, they tend to spend about $2,500 more a year. And this does not include things like additional work, uh, time off, and decreased production, things like that. But most of us in this room are healthcare providers. And so why is this important to us? There are some diseases that are linked to obesity. I'll go as far as to say just about every single disease state is correlated somewhat to excessive weight obesity. And there is a meta-analysis from the British Medical Journal that said, Obesity in and of itself, forget high blood pressure, forget heart disease, forget smoking, just being obese increases your mortality. And this is scary. That might start at BMIs of anything above 22. I think that is quite staggering. Um, that means that having any excessive body fat probably is a detriment to our own health. And so, um, my, my first bold claim here is, as a healthcare provider, weight loss may be the single most powerful tool we have in the prevention and in the treatment of disease. And, and I, I will say that's probably my first bold claim, okay, and I truly believe that. So I'm going to go with the case. And this is probably a case that a lot of us see in the clinic. This is a patient that comes in, female in her 30s, wanting some medications to help lose weight. Does this sound familiar? Okay. Uh, she states she's tried everything and she doesn't even eat.
Yeah, conventional, conventional wisdom, and I think most healthcare providers would fall into this line of the thought process is probably no more than a pound or two a week is safe. However, this was dispelled in New England Journal of Medicine about 10 years ago when they talked about the seven biggest myths that are pervasive in obesity. And to be honest, when individuals lose weight more rapidly, they are more motivated and maybe more likely to stick to that diet. And so there's really no safe. I think what you have to really consider is sustainability. So what are they doing and is that sustainable in the long term? So with that being said, everyone's day. <laughs> yeah, so so with that being said, medications, uh, definitely something we have in our toolbox, um, should be considered when people have BMIs greater than 35 and they haven't achieved about 10 to 15 pounds of weight loss with therapeutic lifestyle changes over six months. Let's talk about our options. Orlistat, um, has anyone actually prescribed these medications? Oh, a few, a few. Orlistat works by blocking the fat absorption. So what is the major side effect? Fecal leakage. So bad that most people after taking one prescription will never prescribe it again. Our other options are the appetite suppressant drugs, fentramine, their combination, fentramine with topiramate and bupropion with naltrexone. Um, I put it this way is, is they come with significant, significant side effect profiles, black box warnings, some of them so dangerous that Europe wouldn't approve them. They're not really recommended over 12 weeks of use. And the costs are quite high. These are medications I typically try to steer clear of just due to the side effect profile. But the medications I think we're gonna be a little bit more interested in is liraglutide and semaglutide. Um, and this has actually moved now towards our first line option when it comes to medications and the treatment of obesity. And I ask, is semaglutide a game changer? Has anyone prescribed semaglutide? Some people, yeah. I have to admit, the New England study last year, astonishing. We're, we're talking about 34 pounds of weight loss in about 15 months. That, that is really, really good. 5% um, dropout rate, mostly due to upset stomach. I tend to be against pharmacotherapy, and I have my own biases. So when you look at the two lead authors, they were sponsored by the drug company. And I do look at some of the, the kind of negatives, the 21000 a year cost when you do it for a good Rx, black box warning for thyroid cancer. I will probably say this is probably a good option for a lot of patients in which you've tried the other modalities. So I am, I'm a little bit, I, I will say, in terms of medications, this is something that is promising. And actually, just recently, semaglutide versus liraglutide head-to-head, semaglutide was uh, more efficient or effective. Yeah, great question. And so it's, it's also approved for non-diabetics. Very good. And actually, the study that was done in New England last year was in all non-diabetic patients. This is probably something that we all give to everyone that wants to lose weight is eat less, move more. That's the conventional wisdom. What does the data show about exercise? Well, 70% of Americans believe that there's really no difference between diet or exercise as the approach to losing weight. And furthermore, most people will choose exercise as the modality of losing weight. Why is this a problem? Well, in head-to-head -head studies and randomized controlled trials, exercise alone doesn't cause weight. Diet plus exercise doesn't do better than the diet alone group. Why? We thought, why? I mean, obviously, if you're burning calories, you should probably be losing weight. Go ahead. That's not a bad thought, actually. That's not a bad thought. So let me, let me go through some of the reasons why exercise is probably an ineffective prescription. Number one, you can't really outrun a poor diet. So if you do some intense activity for about an hour and you eat the donut, you're kind of in a negative hole again. Um, number two, we tend to give ourselves moral licensing psychologically. So if we do something good, say we exercise, well, now I can afford to do it. And then this might be the biggest culprit. 
um, our bodies are in a homeostasis. So we try to conserve energy as best as possible. And so when you go out, which is probably something no other animal does, try to burn calories, your body will find ways to preserve it. And so your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, the fidgeting, the standing, the walking, all of that will probably unconsciously go down and go down significantly. And non-exercise activity thermogenesis can be responsible from anywhere to 800 to over 3,000 calories of burn a day. And so exercise in and of itself is probably not the best modality to lose weight. I do think, and this is another bold statement, that exercise is probably more important in nutrition when it comes to health. So yes, I do encourage it, but I don't ever say that's going to help you lose weight. You shouldn't even look at the calories that you're burning. I think it's going to be a wash. Any thoughts, any questions? Caloric restriction, does this work? Um, and then is it all about calories in, calories out? The calories in, you control what you put in your mouth. The calories out is our basic metabolic rate, the exercise and non-exercise activity thermogenesis, and the thermogenic effect of food. The first law of thermodynamics will tell you that this is true, and I believe this to be true. It always comes down to calories in, calories out. As we'll see, there's going to be some caveats to this that's going to make it a little bit challenging. And so when it comes to caloric restriction, why is it that we can't maintain a caloric restriction when we try? Over 80% of participants, when they're enrolled in a weight loss study, or even in our own personal experience, they tend to gain the calories back. Why do you think that is? When you look at the biggest loser, this is one uh, good example is, is, as soon as you start losing weight and you become a smaller you, your daily caloric needs go down. And then sometimes metabolic adaptations kick in in which your metabolism will slow down even more. This could be anywhere from 500 to 700 calories, meaning that if you were an individual that cut your calories down to 500 and now you got to a smaller you, you're going to need to cut your calories even more to lose that extra weight. And so now you need that caloric restriction just to maintain it. And so this is part of the issue with caloric restriction, but the bigger one... This is probably the, it's the willpower. And we got to talk a little bit about willpower and the psychology behind it. So I like this quote a lot is, it's hard to argue with the belly since it has no ears. And when it comes to willpower, there, there's a couple of reasons why caloric restriction fails, is we have two very prominent dopamine pathways. And so when there's this delicious piece of cake in front of us, there's one pathway that says, oh, no, I can't eat it. It's going to go straight to my hips. Then there's another pathway that says, oh, my God, that looks delicious. I'll eat it now, and then I'll burn off the calories later by working out. Which pathway do you think is going to win? The pathway that wants to eat it now. And it's actually crucial for our survival from evolution is you don't, take, you don't say no to the calories in front of us. And so when you look at studies on willpower, individuals that exhibit the most willpower in all aspects of their life, be it at work, be it with their relationships, finances, whatever, they still don't have the willpower to say no to food. It's akin to say, hold your breath and stop breathing. And so willpower alone is probably not a good modality when it comes to losing weight. And, and I, think, I think this is important because, let me put it this way, is obesity, I think, is a natural and a healthy response to just an unhealthy environment. And I know there's always a lot of judgment with individuals that have obesity. We think, oh my God, they're lazy oh, my God, they're kind of weak-willed-minded and so forth. And I, I don't think this is the case. I just think our environment is set up for failure the way it is right now. Have you guys heard this? Yeah, this is the bro science, and there is some truth to this. But in general, um, this is not true. And smaller individuals will actually need more calories to burn weight, and larger individuals will actually need more calories to burn weight. But if you go with this as a generalization, if you cut down 500 calories a day, then a week you should lose about a pound of weight. So caloric, caloric deficiency, uh, that's the end goal, but not the means. And then I know we're, we're all told about yo-yo dieting is bad for you. This actually came from animal models, more recent studies haven't really uh, proved that. And actually, there might be some benefits to people who lose a lot of weight and gain it back. So I always say, give it a try. It's probably better than not trying at all and not losing the weight, honestly. At least some of the, the newer studies may be showing that, too. 
And I want to talk about, and this is probably uh, a lot of people uh, really, really like discussing, the ketogenic high fat and then paleo Atkins high protein diet. What these both have in car common is low carbohydrate diet. Um, and I think this is probably something that we probably even recommend to our patients, cut out the carbs. Is that something? I know we have an endocrinologist in the room. Um, this is probably something that I think gets recommended a lot. All diets work and diets don't work, that contradiction. And so all diets work in that if you're able to caloric, re caloric restrict, create that caloric deficit, you will lose weight. However, that second statement, diets don't work, is also true. It must be sustainable. And so losing weight can happen initially one month, five months, six months. But how about over a year and, and longer? And this is where I think, you know, diets don't work tends to be the uh, more prominent statement. When we talk about why are so many people against carbohydrates or what's the theory to ketogenesis, it comes down to your body utilizing the glycogen stores and then causing lipolysis to break down fat as an energy source when you don't give your body carbohydrates. This ketosis typically happens when 90% of your calories comes from fat, and actually protein can become carbohydrates through your body. Um, and it's exciting because when you lose the glycogen stores, you're going to lose a lot of water weight. That could be five to 10 pounds in a week if you go into a fasting or a ketogenic or a low carb diet. And we said earlier that if you lose weight quicker, you might be more excited. And that might make you make other changes that are also giving you a healthier lifestyle. And so this is what we see with keto all the time is, is oh, I lost so much weight, but then what happened? And so when you look at some of the studies, we first have to ask ourselves, is a calorie a calorie? And I think the answer to that is no. When we look at fats versus protein, calorie for calorie, carbohydrates actually will lose, lead to more body fat loss. Fat intake, higher fat intakes, you may lose more weight overall initially, but that's water and actually lean muscle. And I know there's, there's even cardiologists that have discussions that favor the high fat diet. And I'm going to show you kind of some studies that may steer you away from that. And I will say, Chicken was actually shown to be the most fattening of the foods. And this is probably the food that we recommend the most for people when they want to lose weight, the high protein uh, sort of food. But this is from Kevin Hall from the NIH, looking at about 20 different studies. One study favored the high fat diet. A couple didn't show a difference. But by far and out, most studies show that the higher carbohydrate intake diet will lead to more body fat loss about 16 grams a day, which means that if you just eat the same amount of calories, fat versus high carbs, high fat versus high carbs, the high carb lose over a pound a month of body fat, just the same amount of calories. Um, I think that's pretty staggering. And just recently, it just came out. I mean, not only do most people regain their weight after five months on, say, uh, keto or paleo, there are significant side effects associated with it. Um, dyslipidemia, cancer, diabetes, even increased all-cause mortality. So this is a tough one for me because I do get patients all the time in clinic, doc, I have an upset stomach, I'm having all this pain, and I ask, well, what do you eat? And they're like, oh, I just want keto and I'm losing a lot of weight. And it's tough because obviously they're encouraged by the weight loss and I don't want to take that away from them. How do you, do you guys deal with this? Have you guys you guys steer them away? Do you just say, well, keep going and tough one? I, I, I try to kind of let them know, and this ends up being a long spiel about why I don't think keto is a good idea, but I'm glad it's working and we can continue trying it for a little bit. However, I do think incorporating some healthier foods into your diet may help your abdominal and so forth, but this is tough. We kind of talked a little bit about some of the things I don't really think work that well, but what does work. Mediterranean diet. Um, this, was, this was coined by Ansel Keys. I don't know if you guys have heard of Ansel Keys in the 1950s. He's also known for the Minnesota starvation diet uh, studies. Um, this was right after World War II when the number one threat to America after the war was heart disease. And what he found is a correlation. America had the most heart disease 
Countries that had the least amount of saturated fat in their diet had the least amount of heart disease. He used Italy and Spain as the example and brought that back. What they found in the Mediterranean region is, is they have a lot of plants, minimally processed, they don't use butter, and it's low in animal protein. When I say only 23% of their calories is from fat, and this is really important because if you go to the literature today and you look at diets that are considered low fat, how they do, they typically use 30 to 40% of calories fat, way more than what's uh, uh, reported back in the 1950s. And so the Mediterranean has now become the gold standard, mostly for health, not so much for weight, about six pounds of weight per year, but for health across the board, it's shown to improve so many key measures that we look at, be it diabetes, be it your blood pressure, be it all cause mortality, heart disease and whatnot. So it's a great diet. And the other good thing about the Mediterranean diet is the other diets tell you what you can't eat and don't eat when you're hungry. With the Mediterranean diet, it's got a high retention rate in large part because you're able to eat. What happens if you take the meat, the oil, and the dairy away? Well, one such study was just done uh, last year, and they compared the Mediterranean to a plant-based diet. Plant-based diet being less meat, eggs, dairy, less animal protein, more fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts, seeds, mushrooms, herbs, and spices. And what happens? Well, 13 pounds additional weight loss over the Mediterranean diet in 16 weeks. And six, that's that's significant, and they also had better lipid panels and insulin sensitivity. So when it comes to the research now on plant-based diet, I will, I will go to my grave saying it's, it's hard to overlook. When we look at observational studies, we're talking about 10,000 people, we're talking about 60,000 when you look at the Adventists, we're looking at 100,000 people when you look at the EPIC. Observational studies have shown time and time and time and time again those who are vegan or vegetarian tend to have lower BMIs and they tend to gain less weight over time. But these are observational studies, right? So causation and correlation are two very, very different things. And so we have now had, in the last two years, 19 randomized control trials also using plant-based diet and they all have led to significant weight loss. Um, just recently in JAMA, looking at 300,000 people they, they said that plant-based diet is a really effective tool for diabetes, specifically because people will lose weight. And then there's one study I didn't mention, the broad study. This is actually a really cool one to look into. This study was unique for two really important reasons. Number one, the intervention group that got the plant-based diet, they lost the weight at six months, and it, they kept it off over a year. And I said that five to six month range, a lot of diets will work but can you sustain it after a year? Most diets tend to fail. However, long-term, the broad study showed that. And the other thing about the broad study, which is also remarkable, is it showed the most amount of weight loss in any single diet that did not restrict calories. So if I told you to eat just 1,000, I gave you 1,000 calories, you would probably lose more. But it said eat at live, eat as much as you want, and they lost the most amount of weight than any sort of other interventional study ever done. Four to five points off their BMI came from that study. And so the question is, oh, why, why does a plant-based diet work? And we talked a little bit about semaglutide. I would say this is a cheap and nature's way of giving you semaglutide. Um, fiber is basically the undigestible material by us that gets digested by our gut. Our gut then converts it into trans, neurotransmitter hormones, short-chain fatty acids that then release things like GLP-1 and release things like peptide YY that have the similar effects of semaglutide when it comes to weight loss without necessarily the side effect profile. And the side effects of fiber is usually decreased rates in cancer, decreased diabetes, decreased weight, blood pressure. We talked about it in clinic appendicitis, and there's a correlation with appendectomies and Parkinson. I'd go as far as to say decreased dementia also with higher fiber intake. So, there's one thing you learn today. One thing, eat more fiber. That, that's probably the most important take home point I'm gonna to go today. And so we're gonna ask 
why does fiber work? And this is another bold claim I will make right now, is obesity does not exist in the wild. Um, they are finding animals that are near campgrounds that are eating the leftover junk food of humans. They are a little bit chubbier than other animals in the wild. <laughs> However, <laughs> obesity does not exist in the wild. And why is it? Is we all have these natural mechanisms that work. And so if we eat the diet we were meant to eat, and when I say meant to eat, ancestral homo sapien studies look, look at the fiber intake. It's postulated that we consumed upwards to 100 to 150 grams of fiber a day. Today, the RDA, the, the recommended amount is about 30 grams, and most Americans get about 15 grams. It's a significant amount less than probably what we were consuming. And so what are the mechanisms? Number one, it fills. Per volume, there's, there's not a lot of calories. And so it fills up your stomach, and you, you tend not to eat other foods at that meal. Number two, it slows down gastric emptying, similar to our GLP-1s, and that will let our satiety hormones kick in and kind of say, you know what, I'm kind of full. Um, fiber alone, and this is interesting, is, is the more fiber you have in the gut, the more our body works to break that down. And so just eating high fiber, you may burn an extra 50 calories just from switching fiber from, say, protein. Um, calories from fiber is not fully observed, meaning if I give you 300 calories of chicken, and 300 calories of nuts, you'd probably get about 300 calories in you from chicken. You'd probably only get 200 calories in you from nuts. We just can't break them all down, and they pass us by. Um, it blocks the absorption of other nutrients. And then the last one, which is really cool, is there's an ileal break, meaning undigested food that reaches our ileum. And you don't actually have to eat fiber. You can go the other way, too, and it'll work. But undigested food that reaches the ileum will tell our body to slow down in eating. All these effects can lead to about 200 to 500 less calories per day. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I don't think as well. Yeah, no, that's a great question. The overarching, uh, the overarching sort of evidence with supplements is not as good. It's not as good. So, yeah. And this may be a shocker, but the most satiating food are potatoes. And I know people tend to give potatoes a bad rap. And yeah, when they're fried in oil, <laughs> they're probably not as good for you. But potatoes, when they're boiled or steamed, are actually one of the most nutritious and filling foods that I think we can have. Per calorie, they're, they were ranked the most satiating food. All right. We'll briefly talk about intermittent fasting. This is um, an entire topic on its own. I feel like a lot of people here have now played with intermittent fasting and understand intermittent fasting to a degree. There are two major modalities of intermittent fasting. Probably the one that most people are familiar with is the 16-8. All right, people know what the 16-8 is? Um, here's a typical 16-8 intermittent fasting program is you don't eat until say 12 p.m. And then you can eat as much as you want from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. And then you call it quits. And then you fast from 8 p.m. And 16 hours later, you can eat again at 12 p.m. Uh, the more studied form of intermittent fasting is actually the 5-2 method. Do you guys know what the 5-2 is? This is actually the one that's been more studied. And you can see um, just recently in December in JAMA, there's an umbrella review with over 130 randomized controlled trials. Um, and 5-2 is the predominant method. What that means is five days of the week, you can do whatever you want. But in two days, you got to limit your calories to about 500 to 600 calories a day, however you'd like to do that. Actually, really, really positive. Really positive sort of um, results. Statistically significant weight loss at three months, six months, and at one year. And up to 5% of body weight. Uh, was lost, which is pretty good. Some of the downsides of fasting, however, um, not as sustainable as the Mediterranean diet was. So there is a higher dropout rate, and we always talk about sustainability. And I think number two, this should be this should be noted is is I think intermittent fasting is a tool. It's not the holy grail, but it can be a tool. And it's not only a tool; it's a tool because it helps you with your willpower. It's a little bit easier to say no to food when you identify as an individual that just doesn't eat food at that time, you know? And I made the example with if you're a Muslim and there's bacon, 
you don't get tempted. It's just not something that you do. And so it's a tool in that it helps our willpower quite a bit. And so this is something I will also make the other caveat is with our patients, blood pressures can lower quite a lot while fasting and same could their blood sugars too. So dose adjustments should be made. Um, early, restrict, early time restricted feeding. The 2017 Nobel Prize in Medicine was on research on chronobiology, broader circadian rhythm. And here's some interesting, uh, some interesting findings that we have. We probably burn 50% more calories when we eat it in the morning than at night. And so I know people think calories are a calorie and you can eat them at any time. I'm probably here to say eating at night is probably a lot worse for you than eating in the morning, a lot worse for you. Um, not, only, not only from a weight loss perspective, but even from your lipid panel, your uh, insulin sensitivity perspective, things like that. Um, this was a cool study with a really, really easy intervention that I think all of us you know, recommended. Most people eat about 14 hours a day. You say eat your first breakfast meal or whatever at 8 a.m. and you probably keep eating to about 10 p.m. Well, if you cut that 14 hours down to 10, was weight loss. That wasn't really hard to do, seven pounds. And the cool thing about that study is just about all the participants said, I want to continue doing this for the rest of my life because I feel so much better. That's a really easy win. Here's another really cool, um, cool little study. It's 2,000 calories from military people. If you took them in the morning for breakfast versus if you take them in the evening for dinner, the breakfast group actually loses weight. So the same amount of calories, and you know what they told them? Because a lot of people postulated that maybe if you eat in the morning, you're going to have more energy to burn it off. They said, don't exercise. And even so, some of these mechanisms were working out, but even so, you burn more calories when you eat them. And so your biggest meal ideally should be earlier in the day, and you should gradually eat less and less. Please. From University of Chicago. Oh. Um, the same caloric restriction when you put people on five to set five hours of sleep versus eight hours of sleep, people will lose more weight on the eight hours of sleep. Um, sleep is an incredible topic on its own, but I think, I know, it will undermine your weight loss efforts. And I will say another bold claim right, right now. Um, there's a lot, and I actually want to do another talk on sleep in and of itself. The bold claim is I think sleep is more important than nutrition and exercise combined. Every single animal engages in sleep, and one-third of our life is spent sleeping, and yet we as a society have really just undermined that, and what do we have is really poor health to show for it. And uh, the studies will kind of, it's hard. It's really hard. There's a lot of stressors. There's increased appetite and things like that that occur when we don't get the adequate amount of sleep. Weighing yourself. I know a lot of people... Um, there's always the fear that if I weigh myself, I'm not going to like it, and then screw it, you know? The what the hell effect. And, yeah, there, there is always concern, and I think we have trouble um, recommending it. I think we have trouble ourselves because sometimes we don't like the number that we see. However, the accountability uh, aspect of weight loss is really huge. And it's not only a scale. It could be doing it in a group. You know, that, that really helps is when you're in a group and you guys talk about, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to hold you accountable. That accountability aspect is really good. It was recommended before. Now there are some RCTs that have shown that weighing yourself regularly, maybe daily, maybe a couple times a week, does lead to weight loss. And this has made it to the guidelines of the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and the Obesity Society. And so I, it's something that I don't think we ever recommend to our patients. But I, I think it's helpful in letting them know that people who tend to weigh themselves will do better. And then water. Um, there, there's a few things about, I guess, hydration. Drinking water, and this is usually about 10 to 12 cups a day, does lead to weight loss. A lot of people think, well, you're probably just not drinking the other beverages, say soda, things like that, that are really caloric. But water may actually boost our metabolism a little bit. It does play a role with angiotensin, and what they find with angiotensin is that it may actually promote a little bit of weight gain. At least there's a correlation that heavier people tend to have higher levels of angiotensin. And so water independently 
will actually lead to weight loss, even when you account for the sugary beverages and all the other calories, just independently, just drinking more water. And I think that's a really simple one that we can all probably partake in, cheap and effective. Then the last one that I think I want to discuss right now, and this is actually really interesting, is thou shall now commit adulteration. And adultering your food will actually change it, meaning that roasted peanuts probably not as good for you as raw peanuts. A little bit easier to break down. We won't get as full as quickly. We may absorb more calories. So just that sheer fact of roasting something may make it a little bit more palatable and a little bit easier to break down. Well, likewise, a salad versus a smoothie. People tend to eat a lot less calories in their meal when they had a salad than when they eat the smoothie. Even the same exact salad versus smoothie. And so the same thing with peanuts versus peanut butter. There is, however, an exception, and that is soup. Can anyone think of why if I gave you a smoothie, the salad, or the soup, the same identical foods, soup may actually lead to the least amount of calories consumed? Yeah. Yeah, very good. And so it, maybe, and they actually went back and they said, if you sip your smoothie over the same time period as you sip your soup, it actually works just as well. And so eating slowly will release the, uh, the hormones needed to signal satiety. Now, if you're trying to not eat the, uh, eating quickly, you may not observe the calories because you have undigested food, but in general, with satiety, eating slowly is actually really, really important, and it will lead to satiety a lot better. Um, so some take-home points. You know, I, I think this one is the exercise of willpower. I know we try so much to encourage just eat less and move more, I don't think that is the most effective strategy. Um, I would say eat more and eat more fiber, that is. And then uh, some important things on the side is just sleep, hydration, and accountability. Any thoughts, any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, those are good questions. And actually, so one would think that sparkling water with no calories may be more effective because of the, the bubbling and so forth, and hasn't really shown out. So I think regular water is the preferred, as of right now, the preferred drink in terms of when it comes to weight loss. I don't worry about hyponatremia provided that they're eating food, things like that. It's properly functioning kidneys should, and now if they're on a diuretic, things like that, maybe but I don't worry about hyponatremia. In terms of what you said, the Gatorade, the G2, the, I don't, well, actually, so you're probably now looking in the realm of performance, right? And they've done studies where they look at Gatorade, they look at coconut water, they look at regular water, and even from performance standpoint, water actually outperforms them. And so, yeah, I think water is recommended. There might be two beverages that might be better, and that's tea and that's coffee. So those two might be a little bit better from other aspects, but in general, just water alone is great. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. This, I, I know it's like psychology or so. I don't know too much about it. Do you recommend it? Yeah. That's very good. And actually, in Japan, in Okinawa, um, I, didn't, I didn't get into this, the blue zones, there are certain areas in the world where people live the longest. Okinawa, Japan is one of them where they had the most centurions, people who lived to 100 years. A common saying that they have is eat till you That's actually a very common saying that they have. And believe it or not, when you give it time, you, you start getting full. And so, yeah, I, I'm not 
culture, there's probably accountability and things like and motivation. All of those things from the psychological standpoint are important. Yeah. Yeah. No, so I don't think so. And going back to the University of Chicago, um, people are at the same calories throughout the course of the day. Even if you're, and, and so I do think some of the effects, they are the hormonal, the, when you don't sleep, the ghrelin levels, the leptin levels. So there's increase. Not only is there more of an appetite, more an appetite for, say, junk food, but even if you give the people the same exact meals, those who get less sleep will tend to lose more. And, and some of them, were, uh, they may actually may play a role with the gut bacteria. Um, there, there's, there's a lot, and I think this is being uncovered, but I don't think it's just when you're sleeping, you're fasting. No, I, I think there's a lot more to it. Very good question, and this is, a, this is an entire sort of uh, lecture in it itself. So fasting is, showing to, is, is being shown to have some improvements. Um, so I, I think, let me give you the example when we say caloric restriction is, if someone eats 2,000 calories, say, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., versus someone eats the same 2,000 calories from a shorter time window, and then they fast, um, there, there, are some, there are some benefits. Um, however, it depends a little bit on when you eat it. And there is some concern now with some of the newer studies that eating late, eating all those 2,000 calories late, may actually lead to maybe less insulin sensitivity. But in general, when we fast, yeah, you do, you do kind of activate some hormones, which will improve insulin sensitivity. It'll definitely decrease blood pressure. From my last talk, we talked about how sodium um, one high sodium meal can cause your blood pressure to rise for about three to four hours. And then what do we do is we eat again another three or four hours. And so our blood pressure is perpetually high. Well, when you're fasting, your blood pressure will get some time to, and so yeah, there are some benefits outside of that. There is some, and I haven't seen this from like DEXA scans, but there's thought that growth hormone increases when you fast. And so you may preferentially, um, and actually I do think there is, you may preferentially preserve muscle and actually use body fat as your source, whereas if you calorically restrict, you will lose muscle. You will lose muscle over time if you just calorically restrict. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, and so I do think fasting along with sleeping and not eating at night, I think those were really part of our natural environment along with fiber intake. And, and I, I tend to think there is something to it. I really do. I think there is something to all of that. And trying to live more in accordance to how probably we were from that standpoint, I think, yeah. Say that again. Possibly, possibly, but I think it depends on what you're doing also, because you still need the energy for your daily activities and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. That is a great question. That is a great question. I didn't actually look into that. I, I definitely will. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that, that is a... 
I am not aware of any sort of study of that kind. I, I will look into that. Um, and I tend to agree with you. Um, that goes back to accountability. And so you as a physician can keep them accountable. And I think patients, they always know, doc, I wasn't as good this time or, you know, or I'm really glad. So I do agree with you, but I don't know in terms of what the data or the literature shows. I'll look into that though. Any other, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I do you want my own personal in? No. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, and, and so this, I think, I think I, I make this analogous to alcohol, very much so. Is and, and I think now more and more data is coming out. I don't think alcohol is good for us at all. I, I and now it's coming to to the light that alcohol is probably quite detrimental to our health. But not everything we need to do must promote longevity, right? And so. Um, health is different from person to person to person. So one must ask, what do you want from your health? And if it's weight loss, you know, I can prescribe plant-based diet and they can come back and tell me, but I really love a burger. And okay, it, this, is, this is your prerogative. But, you know, I, I think it's what do you want from health? From my own standpoint, I will tell you, I've lost a lot of friends not socializing at night um, just because you don't feel the same. There's something about to bed early that just makes the next day just a lot better um and, and i will tell you i'm trying to find more friends that would rather play tennis during the day um and so yeah from a social aspect i've really shifted my gears and my thought process and it's trying to be more of the person that i find that i want to be yeah but you're absolutely right at the end of the day that you know individualized care is important Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think the I think I'd say no to that answer. Um, because if we just recommended, you know, just consume 1200 calories, it's not really feasible. You know, and a lot of people don't really know what a calorie is, you know, and so um, I think the better, better way to go about it, and this is what I like about when you when you talk about something like a whole food plant based diet is, is there's no counting. And here's the other thing is, is normally when you're hungry, it makes sense to reach for food. When you're telling your body when you're hungry, don't eat, you're kind of confusing the system and with a low with nutrient dense caloric or foods. You can eat and eat, get full, and not really get the calories. So I, I don't know if we just said as a blanket statement, lower your calorie. I don't think it would work. In terms of going back, um, I'm sure they were consuming more calories just because if you consume more saturated fat and saturated fat foods, they're going to be higher in calories. They, they just are. Oh. See that again? When they typically, typically it's hard to consume the same amount of calories in a condensed time. And so most, I think that is the mechanism is caloric deficit. You're consuming less calories, you know, because in a single meal, you can only eat so much. Now, if you have four meals a day or break it down to two meals a day, yeah, you're probably going to create a little bit of a deficit. Yeah.
Yeah. That, that actually probably one of the most practical questions that's asked. So I think it's understanding that I and everyone else is vulnerable to temptation. And so how do we create the environment, right? And so in my house, there's not really those barbecue chips, you know? And so if I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it when I eat out, things like that. It's trying to create that environment. Like I said, intermittent fasting may save the willpower. I think you're someone who typically only eats, you know? So during that time when it's not your window, it could be in front of you and you're not going to eat it at that time. So we can create tools, different things to really um, increase willpower. But yeah, it's tough. I would say it's really tough today, especially in our setting where everywhere we go, there's cookies and there's chips. And yeah, it, it becomes really, really hard to keep. And, and what they find with willpower is, is it is like a muscle. So, and if you flex it once, and then you flex it twice, it's going to fatigue. And then this is why at nighttime we become weak and, oh, I'm not going to cook that dinner anymore. I'm just going to order that pizza. And so, um, but here's a couple things on willpower that are important is sleep. Sleep has shown to increase our willpower. And so if you feel really fatigued, take a 15 minute nap. That might actually give you enough and actually hypoglycemia can do the same. And so a piece of fruit, just a piece of fruit, if you're pondering, eat, eat like an apple and then come back to it, that might give you a little bit more willpower to come back, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please. Dr. Ivan, you can please. Uh... Can Is hear? it me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Suros. Thank you for the, for the nice overview. And I may have missed some of the questions. So I do apologize. We were not able to hear the questions uh, virtually. So if this is a repetition, um, I do apologize for that. But um, thank you for showing that uh, weight gain has multiple mechanisms and multiple factors that are involved. And obviously our current world is built in a way that passively, if we are so passive about our health, we're gonna gain weight and losing weight or even having a steady weight is really like an active daily thing. So we need to always be mindful of that. And um, going back to the emphasis on behavior, and we do know that uh, obesity now, it's a social epidemia due to the fact how our buildings are built, to the food deserts, uh, the the expensiveness or the finances because plant based diet and vegetables are quite expensive mainly in the U S more than any other place I've been to. So in order to tie this into the behavioral changes that uh, we instruct patients to do every day, what is an easier way for us as clinicians? who are always have time constraints or restraints um, with our visits in clinic. What is uh, your approach if we have a patient in clinic, like, and if you wanna yeah. like give them a few tips before they leave clinic after we've addressed multiple medical problems? Okay, I, I'm gonna try to rephrase the question is, is given the time constraints in clinic, given some of the barriers that we have, what is practical advice that as a healthcare provider I can provide with my patients? And I think this is a great question. Um, I think first and foremost, these are patients that I try to get back to my clinic more frequently because in one visit, I'm not gonna tackle it, but I try to get them back in maybe in a couple weeks time. And the other thing is, is maybe give them just one homework assignment for that time being, you know? And so one practical thing is we can discuss some cheap food alternatives that are high in fiber, that are healthy, things like that. Um, and, I, and I'll go through, you know, different sort of these things at different visits when I, when I have the opportunity. Um, but typically, yes, I, I think some really, really good breakfast with oatmeal. You know, I think it's a super cheap, super um, healthy, nutritious thing. And it goes back to eating a lot of calories in the morning versus a later and filling you up. So yeah, there are 
I don't think you could do it all in one visit. I, I really don't. And I would bring them back and try to see if they kind of were successful in the first part and then go about and adding more to it. It's a tough one, though. It's definitely, it's a definitely a tough one. Thank you. I think that's a satisfactory to your answer. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. Ooh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I think diet is probably worse for you than regular. I'll say that again. I think diet soda is probably worse for you than regular. Um, there was a recent study that showed in females, diet soda is linked to strokes. Diet soda is linked to strokes. Um, I think, I don't think we have the evolution <laughs> mechanism. <laughs> To really break down diet. I, I don't think our body recognizes it. And so what, what, what has been shown is we overconsume sweeter foods when we drink diet. I, know I, I think Coke is terrible for you too. So heroin or crack, what's your choice? But for people who think that diet is better, you're not getting calories, I think it's a terrible, terrible option. Some of the other sweeteners, some of the data, you know, like stevia, monk fruit, some of that is still not really out. Um, in general, I try to steer away from them. Yeah, that's a really good question. Unless, unless your body recognizes the calories from the regular Coke and may not eat those calories later on, whereas a Diet Coke, it does not recognize and may still feel hungry and may still want something sweet. And so there, there are some nuances to, to weight loss. Um, in, in general, you're right. Liquid, liquid calories tend to be the worst. Our body doesn't recognize them that well. But sugar, and, and this is, <laughs> I'm going to go way over, but if you guys want, this is actually a really cool experiment that's done is if you take a machine that just squirts liquid calories, so there's no taste, and you can go to the machine anytime you want, so there's no social pleasure. People tend to take the amount of calories that they need throughout the day. They tend to, and you know what happens with obese individuals? They tend to decrease their calories by about, to total about 200, because you take away the pleasurability and so forth. And so we do have signals in our body with calories. And so diet soda being void of that I, I think does have some detriment. My, my, my own personal two cents on that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you guys. Uh.